Hello and welcome to this video on the bipolar junction transistor. In our previous video we introduced the topic of semiconductors and specifically the PN junction which we're going to apply to the construction of a bipolar junction transistor. So if you haven't watched our previous video it's worth going back and checking that out before watching this one. But moving on with the bipolar junction transistor and transistors in general, first is to say that transistors are just about everywhere now and they're at the core of all modern electronics. All microchips and processors are comprised of many transistors and so an example here um, is, is a processor from a, an iPhone, uh, the iPhone 6S in this particular instance, uh, contains around 3 billion transistors and that's housed in this small processor and so what we see now in more modern electronics is that transistors are compressed into very very tiny tiny spaces. Um, another example the Xbox One has a processor that contains around 5 billion transistors. Fortunately for us we're going to take things very simple to start off with and look at one transistor in isolation and how the transistor works. The transistor is a three-legged component and these legs or connections are named the base, the collector and the emitter and they each have a role to play in the operation of the transistor. Transistors are examples of semiconductors and we spoke in the previous video about semiconductors and how they're constructed in order to form junctions. And what this means is, just like in our previous example of diodes, their internal resistance can change. And we'll see how we can apply that to some of the, the applications of transistors in this video. The most important point is that we control the transistor using the base current. We can imagine the transistor as being like a variable resistor, as an analogy. When there's no base current, the resistance is high and no current can flow. But when a small base current is applied, the resistance becomes very low, current can flow. And looking at the diagram there, you can see that the resistance is between the collector at the top and the emitter at the bottom. What this means is that a small base current can allow a very large collector current to flow into the collector and out of the emitter. And this means that the transistor is very useful as an amplifier. We can take very small signals and allow, them to allow the transistor to produce very large signals as a result. We get to a point though, as the base current increases, that maximum current is flowing through the transistor. This is what we call saturation. The transistor is at its lowest resistance and it's allowing the maximum collector current possible. This is the saturation point. We can also measure something called current gain in terms of IC, the collector current, and IB, the base current. We know that the current IC is greater than IB and the difference is known as the current gain. We give the gain the symbol beta and it's equal to the ratio of IC to IB, or IC over IB. A typical gain for a transistor can be around 100, which means if we put 1 milliamp into the base of a transistor, we would expect to see 100 milliamps flowing from collector to emitter. This depends on some of the other components and parameters in the circuit, but it's a general rule of thumb. How does the transistor work? To understand how the transistor works, we're going to refer back to some of the topics looked at in the previous video, namely doping of semiconductors and the formation of PN junctions. We're familiar with the PN junction and how it was applied as a diode in the previous video, but a small modification leads to the structure of a bipolar junction transistor. Here's an example of the structure of what's called an NPN transistor because the layers are n-type, p-type and n-type. Likewise, it's also possible to construct a PNP transistor of p-type, n-type and p-type doped material. 
In this particular video, we'll focus on the N-type. The NPN transistor consists of two N-type regions sandwiching a P-type region. The P-type region is thin and lightly doped compared to the N-type regions. We'll see why this is important later on. Whichever way around we connect the transistor, a reversed biased NP junction is encountered, so current can't flow. We saw in the previous video on diodes that when the uh, diode is connected in reverse bias, current can't flow because of the depletion region. And likewise, in this transistor, the same is true. Whichever way the current is flowing, either into the collector and out of the emitter, or into the emitter and out of the collector, it's going to encounter a reversed biased NP junction, which prevents the current from flowing. A third connection is required, which is of course the base. Now, we'll apply a small voltage at the base. And this will collapse the base to emit a depletion region. Because now we have a forward bias between the base and the emitter, a PN junction in forward bias. Now electrons are able to move freely between the base and the emitter. Because the P-type region is very thin and lightly doped compared to the N-type regions, its holes are quickly populated with electrons. We spoke about electrons and holes in our previous video. But because the P-type layer is so small, the, the, the holes in the P-type layer are soon filled and there's now an excess of electrons and these overspill into the collector region. What we now have is an excess of electrons throughout the transistor and current can flow between the collector and the emitter freely. Since the transistor allows a large current to flow from collector to emitter, with only a small voltage applied to the base, it can be used as an amplifier, since small signals can be amplified into larger ones. It can also be used as an electronic switch, since very small inputs can activate the transistor and trigger an output. Here's an example of such a circuit, where a small input, seen here on the left-hand side, would produce a large output on the right-hand side. We can also use this as a simple amplifier. But there's a problem with this particular circuit, because most of the signals we want to amplify, for instance audio, are generally AC circuits. So we would apply an AC circuit to this particular um, in, a, in a AC signal to this particular circuit and hopefully expect a larger AC signal produced on the output. There's a downside to this, which is that one of the limitations of transistors is that an as an amplifier is that the transistor only operates when the voltage between the base and the emitter is positive. We need that uh, forward biased positive voltage at the base in order to collapse the depre depletion region. The AC input though is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. This means that the transistor doesn't operate in the negative half cycle of the waveform. And so what happens unfortunately is if we try to amplify an AC signal with a simple circuit like this, we actually lose or cut off half of the waveform. The solution to this is something called biasing. Biasing is crucial in order to raise a waveform into the positive domain. What we do is cheat essentially and say, well, if the negative half cycle is not allowed by the transistor, then all we'll do is we'll move the whole waveform up so that it's always in the positive domain. This means that the whole waveform is now amplified. Here's a circuit that features biasing. We still have our transistor in the center, but before the signal or the input reaches the transistor, it goes through this stage here, which is our biasing stage. The biasing stage takes the form of a potential divider. 
and the potential divider has a voltage at its central point which is added to the waveform that's, al that's already entering. So the AC waveform here would be lifted upwards by the extra voltage that's being added by the biasing stage. Now, once that voltage reaches the transistor, it's completely, it's, it's all positive and there's no negative elements to it. We can adjust the amount of uplift or biasing by adjusting this variable resistor here. Some of the other elements in this circuit that are worth pointing out are these coupling capacitors. Capacitors have the property of allowing AC to pass fairly easily, but not allowing DC to pass. And so these coupling capacitors are used to undo the biasing that we've carried out. We've lifted the waveform up in order, to, in order so that it's amplified fully by the transistor, but then we will return it back to the axis again by passing it through one of these coupling capacitors. Likewise, there's a coupling capacitor on the input in case any previous circuitry or stages of amplifiers have carried out biasing also. So I hope you found this video useful, firstly on how to apply the principles of semiconductors and PN junctions to the construction of a bipolar junction transistor, but then also how to apply the uh, bipolar junction transistor to some simple applications such as an electronic switch and an amplifier. This particular amplifier which features, features biasing is, is known as a class A amplifier and it allows the waveform to be fully amplified without any distortion or loss of any negative half cycle.